Uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining. Today, we are lucky enough to have uh, gentleman Mike Phil here from uh, Extreme Molding. Uh, excited to hear what Mike has to say. We've been planning this for quite some time. So a um, little bit on Mike, uh, currently the, the business development manager for Extreme. Um, but we, we did a little, uh, a little background uh, piece here. I know, Mike, you, you graduated from Rensselaer Polytechnic with a degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, looks like you've been with Extreme for about 12 years. I saw production manager, design engineer, operations manager, kind of across the board, uh, lots of different experience. So um, real excited to hear kind of how that shaped, you know, um, your guys' decision making in, in particular with this topic on silicone versus TP. So uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining. And, and with that, Mike, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. All right. Can every, I hope everybody can see the presentation. Um, you know, I do want to say thank you for registering uh, for the webinar. Thank you to Weston, Bennett, Len, and the SODIC team for, for putting this event on. Um, you know, I think it's, it's been a great series so far, sat in one or two of the other webinars uh, run by the SODIC and friends, and have had a really good experience, learned a lot in a short amount of time. So hopefully I can do the same for you guys today. Um, it's going to be a little bit of maybe a different thing that, than, than what most of you are used to. I'm going to break it up after a couple slides and, and really um, lean on Weston and, and his team to kind of help me. But I want to break it up a little bit, add a few questions. Um, you know, I think we've all become accustomed to these virtual meetings. Um, you know, we were joking about it just prior to this presentation about how we have sampled so many different uh, WebEx uh, platforms, uh, you know, go uh, Teams and GoToMeeting and Zoom and Cisco WebEx as well as Microsoft Teams. So, um, you know, it really sampled a whole bunch of different things. And, you know, again, I know that as people continue to talk forever, it gets a little mundane. So I'm not going to do that to you guys today. Hopefully we can get some interaction. Um, so to kick it off, a um, <clears throat> little bit about myself. Bennett, thanks for the intro. Um, as Bennett said, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. I graduated from RPI in 2010. Uh, we are located in upstate New York and I can actually see RPI right from my office. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty cool site. Um, I did play football there for four years, captain my senior year. Uh, I was one of the short little fast jittery bug type of uh, wide receivers, punt returners um, that's on the field. So, you know, ha had a blast. Um, you'll see that I started here at Extreme Molding in 2009. Well, I interned for uh, Lynn and Joanne, the two owners, prior to graduation. So in 2009, the summer of 2009, I had actually gotten laid off because that's when the economy kind of took a downturn. Um, reached out to my father, um, who through a little bit of networking, got a call from Lynn um, and provided me the opportunity to stop the construction and landscaping and the other internship that I eventually got laid off from um, and, and join here. Um, it's been a fantastic adventure ever since. Um, prior to the career fair, my final semester in 2010, Lynn and Joanne offered me a position to join as production manager and design engineer. Um, our engineering team was small and there was only two individuals. And when I joined, I was taking over on the production scheduling, obviously the management, um, but then also focused on the design engineering and looking at CAD files from, from the early onset. So that was very exciting for me in the beginning. Um, and that's all led, you know, I've, I've grown with the company. When I first started, we had four injection molding machines. Uh, we're now up to 14 and three of the original four have been replaced. So we've added, you know, essentially a machine and a half per year over the last 10 years. It's been exciting. Um, and when I joined it from 10 people, we're now up to about 90. We're hovering around 90. Um, when you, I'll get into what we do here next on the next slide, um, which makes us, I think, even more unique than just doing LSR and plastics, um, kind of the full encompassing a turnkey solution for everybody. So um, production manager, design engineer did that for six years um, and then had the opportunity to jump into operations and doing a little bit more of the vendor management, supplier management, um, customer interaction, so on and so forth. And um, Towards the end of 2017, you know, when we, we did a strategic planning session, you know, looked at the full scope of the business and said, where can we really grow? And Lynn and Joanne had offered me the opportunity to jump into business development and sales and really didn't know much about it. You know, I was trained to be an engineer and, and, and assumed that I would continue to do some of those types of things. But 
Um, honestly, I've done more engineering as as I've jumped into the business development manager role, and I also feel that I it, it provides me a unique opportunity to offer design for manufacturability advice from an engineering standpoint. Um, early on, as you guys can see, held a lot of different roles, very hands on in the early days, um, processing and packaging and running running machines. So I've had a great wealth of experience really being on the floor uh, and really understanding our process from, from start to finish. Um, so with that, we're a contracting injection molder in both silicone and plastics. Uh, plastics to, to at this point in time, we're focusing on polypropylene, ABS and TPEs. Um, you know, we have done Triton and some polycarbonates and polyphenol sulfones and a whole bunch. Um, but really I would say about 85% of our business is made up of silicone. Uh, the, the other 15% is plastics. Uh, founded in 2002 by Lynn and Joanne. Lynn came from the materials world. She was at GE Silicones and developed a lot of the grades that we actually work with today. Joanne was an English major and just had a fell in love with manufacturing. So from that standpoint, she jumped right into manufacturing and was really heavily involved with operations and just general management. Both Lynn and Joanne, before starting this business, were worldwide general managers for their respective companies. And, um, you know, as I was getting out of college, I thought, who else could I learn from the ground up better than uh, two women who have kind of gone against uh, the industry, if you will, and uh, started their own injection molding business. So uh, just this past year in December, we have uh, received our ISO certification. It was a big step for us. That was one of those things where, you know, we've never lost the business to not being ISO certified, but we also know that it's prevented us from getting in to other business opportunities because we're not ISO certified. So that was that was something that strategic planning uh, really hit home with last year. And obviously this was pre pandemic, but we continued and put our head down through the pandemic and added four to our professional staff, three of which were engineers, but and also uh, received our 9001 2015 certification uh, in December. We are a turnkey solution. Um, you know, while we, we draw the line when it comes to design for form, fit, and function, but with our experience, we've got you know five engineers on staff. Um, we can offer some design for manufacturability advice, and then based upon you know being hands-on in the LSR TPE world, we really think we can provide some valuable experience for everybody. So we offer some uh, DFM advice. Uh, design for manufacturability, and then we will take your product really from start to finish. Um, so not only, you know, we'll work with you to order the molds, uh, we'll run the parts here, and then we have a 15,000 square foot facility just right up the hill, which is our packaging, assembly packaging and warehouse um, for fulfillment. So we'll do your order, any of the parts that you may see on the screen today, they would actually come directly from our facility. The thought there, and this is something that started way back when, when Lynn and Joanne founded the business, was to control quality more than, you know, may, maybe other people could, rather than using a 3PL or something along those sorts, or even having the customer do their own packaging. Uh, we always felt it was nice to have everything kind of contained under one roof. We can control that quality from start to finish. Um, and, you know, if, if there's anything that needs to be really fixed or corrected, that happens here. So um, it's a unique thing um, we have about 50 customers who we do not only the manufacturing, but also the assembly packaging and fulfillment for as well. So to dive right in, um, you know, I told you I, today would be about LSR and TPEs. Obviously, it's been a little bit of a background about me and our business, but um, at this point in time, we'll dive right into LSR and TPE. So I'll start with similarities. LSR and TPE very much, um, they're similar. They have similar properties at room temperature. Um, and when you're looking for applications for a soft touch feel, whether it be a toothbrush or a hammer or um, electronic wearables or anything like that, we always come into that conundrum of, is it LSR or is it TPE related? And hopefully today I'll be able to give you some of those, those items to help you make a decision. Um, they're both soft touch elastomers, we'll start there. Um, both can be sourced on the Shore A scale. Um, what I will tell you is that Silicone likes to be at a 50 durometer. Um, that's where it likes to be. So a 50 shore A is where silicone really naturally would like to be. In order to decrease the durometer, you're adding in silicone oils and things that at very, very low durometers, including gels, 
if you're to put it on a piece of white paper, put a weight on it, it will actually leach the oils out and onto the paper. Um, likewise with TPE, when building durometer for silicone, what you're going to do is you're adding in raw silica. So again, you're at your 50, you keep throwing in uh, raw silica and that helps build your durometer. We've molded anywhere from a three shore A to an 80 shore A in silicone. And I will tell you wildly different properties um, as far as tear strength, elasticity, elongation. Um, and as you get further away from that 50 durometer, you start to lose some of those inherent properties of why you chose silicone in the beginning. From the TBE standpoint, you're traditionally, you know, you're in that 60 to 70 range is what I would say. Um, we've run on the TBE side, we've run some gels down to the three shore A as well as we've also run um, up to 90 shore A TPEs and TPUs as well um, for more rigid, robust applications. So, you know, I'm going to flip to the next slide and then go back. Um, this one here kind of gives you these are items that we've done internally here um, to kind of give you a little bit of a, a chart here on Shore A. And right, and I can't see the, the mouse, but as I said, silicone wants to be 50. In, that, in between that 40 and 50, you see the baby bottle nipple. We've done a lot of pacifiers, baby bottle nipples. Um, you know, that's really our focus. Our market focus has been in the infant female healthcare market, consumer goods. And that's why you know some of these items that you see here kind of fall within that. Um, and we'll we'll touch more on some customers in, in, in a little while. But again, this the shore A scale, your TPEs are going to be traditionally anywhere from your 40 to your 90 uh, is what we've comfortably run. As I said, we have done some gels. And then on the silicone, I would say we're comfortable anywhere from a three shore A to an 80 shore A. There are limitations. Obviously, you do lose some properties as I discussed, and that's you know that comes later on. Um, regulatory requirements, both TPEs and silicones can be sourced to be biocompatible. There are implantable grades, you know, and so on and so forth. TPEs traditionally need things added to it to be able to meet those regulatory requirements. Some are able to be sourced right away, but the difference that we'll talk about throughout this call is LSR truly has a lot of those things inherently, just organically. It is a, we'll call it a cleaner material. Um, so, again, we'll talk about that as we, as we continue moving forward, and that may help make your decisions as well. Uh, room temperature properties, again, both of them being soft touch, they, they're elastic, um, they have good compression set, at least in comparison to other materials that are available, such as rubbers and TPUs and so on. And so those TPEs and silicones, they really, they'll, they'll outpace some of those other materials at room temperature. When we get outside of room temperature, you'll see and we'll discuss how much silicone can kind of further separate itself. Um, now coming into pricing, uh, pricing, you know, it's, it is very similar. Once, if you are looking for a material that is, it meets all the same regulatory requirements, maybe that silicone does inherently, your TPE price will continue to walk up and really close that gap in between the price per pound. Um, ironically, we, we buy some TPE much more expensive than some grades of silicone. So, um, you know, again, I also discussed that our business is 85% silicone and 15% plastic. So that obviously weighs into that equation a little bit, but for the most part, when we are even sourcing TPEs at higher volumes, you will find similar pricing throughout. Um, again, back to the durometer scale that we already talked about. Uh, let's see, okay. Figured I'd break it up at this point. Um, I know that, this is probably a little bit early on in the presentation, but um, my owner, Lynn, sat through a very uh, interactive, if you will, call it a presentation webinar yesterday and had a lot of a lot of feedback and being interactive. It was again, it broke it up. We're all used to these virtual webinars at this point. So. Weston, I don't know if I will get the questions in particular, um, if I'll see those on my screen. Um, but at this point, I will, I'll, um, go ahead. Like I'll, I'll have an eye on the Q and A section here. Yeah. Um, if something comes in, I'll relay it over to you. Okay. So just question one, and again, if you guys can give uh, Weston, whether it's a thumbs up, a yes, no, something along those lines. 
Um, out of curiosity, who on this webinar works with both LSR and TPE at this stand at this point? Um, you know, again, we. It's interesting as as we. Approach over molding products or, or different products for different industries. We come to this conundrum a lot. Um, I would say maybe daily. I'm I'm trying to figure out whether I'm going to go the LSR direction or the TPE direction for quotations. So, um, you know, if everybody's tuned in, if you don't mind throwing out there to Weston, who works with both? We're we're getting a few uh, coming in right now, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. That are working with both, saying a couple saying only uh, TPA and not not LSR at this point. So, okay. Yeah. Well, then hopefully, hopefully for for you individuals that uh, are not working with LSR, you can you know you can learn a little bit about what we're gonna more of the things that we're gonna talk about today uh, that may help you make the decision to lean towards LSR or TPE. You know, again, we do a lot more LSR. Um, we're more well versed in that arena, um, but TPE is something that we have a lot of experience with as well. So, so that's good. So there's people on here that have both. That's good. Um, and I assume if you are working with both, that you know, is anyone working on a project now where they're considering on whether to incorporate an elastomer or not? Again, just out of curiosity, um, this is something I come across every single day uh, between my outside sales rep and myself. Um, you know, we average about four to five leads per day through our website, and I would say, I don't know, maybe 10% of those over a given week um, really force you to decide one way or another, but every day we're having this discussion, so. Oh, I actually can see the Q and A. So, Paul, I saw that you said that you were considering TPE in your new project. Um, you know that that's great. I think a lot of these things, you know, especially from an elastomer standpoint. I mean, this is one of the things again that we do every day. I've got a whole pile of, of samples over here that I can probably show you guys as we get moving forward. Um, but uh, TPE is a great product, um, and so is LSR. So hopefully, again, throughout this project, hopefully you learn a, throughout this presentation, hopefully you learn a little bit more, and maybe you'll make a decision to go to LSR. Let's see. All right, moving on. Um, all right, so we're going to start with the LSR advantages. Um, the LSR advantages overall, um, you know, again, we talked about this inherently. So TPE is you can build, right? You can build those. Weston, really quickly, are you guys seeing the full presentation or are you seeing a bunch of different things? I I see a couple of boxes covering a portion of your there. Yeah, I'm like working that. on it. Okay. How about now? It should be better now. It, yeah, it looks good now, Mike. Okay. So LSR advantages. Um naturally, you you know, we talked about low compression set for both materials. Well, silicone will take the cake. Um, you know, low compression set on silicone. Now, as you get lower in durometers, that compression set gets a little bit worse because as we talked about, you're building, you're building a, or you're formulating those lower durometers by adding silicone oils into the process. So you're losing some of those natural um, properties that you decided with silicone in the, in the beginning. So the lower the durometers, the, be, the worse the compression set's gonna get. Um, again, somewhere between that 30, 40, 50 range that's really going to give you your best compression set or lack thereof. Um, naturally, silicone is inert to a lot of a lot of chemicals. Um, you know, we have some dental applications where these where silicone products are just thrown in a vat of bleach for 24 hours, and you know, silicone comes out no problem, stretches just the same, reacts just the same, and everything else. Um, silicone is also hypoallergenic, so again, through the, the the course of the types of products that we do. Uh, in, in general, hypoallergenic is something that we're going to want to want to have. Um, you know, again, it's a very important feature for some of those things. I wouldn't go as far. Well, I, I'll skip down to that. Great weatherability. 
silicone's fantastic when it comes to temperature um, and, and its functioning temperatures. You know, um, we have a product currently now that gets introduced to 450 degrees day after day after day for hours at a time. And the product functions the same way after hundreds and thousands of cycles the way it did on day one. So um, it also will maintain its properties as close to minus 100 F is where you can kind of get to. Um, we actually do cryogenic deflashing in-house, which drops the silicone parts to minus 250 F and then pings it with a plastic media, breaks off all that excess flash, and then you're ready to go. So it is very good at different temperatures. Inherently, it's UV stable. Again, when you're working with plastics, TPEs, and, and, and really any plastics, uh, you have to have a UV additive. Um, you know, that's a very important thing when it comes down to that. Now, that's, you know, not, that's just UV from a degradation standpoint. So, um, water as well, uh, silicone can be doused with water, obviously, uh, as well as TPE. And it also does not soak up a lot of the different chemicals that it, it, it really, you don't get any type of absorption of other chemicals. There is some, there are some chemicals out there that you can do for weight testing and, you know, cure rate and those types of things. But they're very, very specialized chemicals. Silicone being inert and everything else really does not soak in a lot. So um, easy to clean and sterilize. You know, we talked about silicone and its inherent capabilities to just bite off a lot of these things. It's not antimicrobial. You know, that's that's one of those things that I wanna make sure people understand. Silicone is not antimicrobial um, just on its own, um, but you can clean it, you can sterilize it, you can throw it in the microwave, you can throw it in the oven if you wanted. Uh, a lot of people use dishwashers, boiling, boiling water. Um, there's microwave steamable, sterilizable bags that obviously a part like this, this is a, this part actually in the top right is a um, dual durometer pacifier. So that internal substrate is a 70 durometer and the outside is a 20 durometer short A um, that, you know, you can see uh, came out great. Um, this is a new product for us. We've only been molding it about a month and a half and it's it's been fantastic. So, um, the other thing too from silicone, low viscosity, low injection pressures. I think this product probably showed it pretty well. You see those through holes there um, and you also see some shutoffs for overmolding. Um, those through holes, as you can see, as the silicone passes through those through holes, there's no bubbles that are being created. You know, again, from, from an engineering standpoint, bubbles are an aesthetic problem. Yes, if they get to the surface, they can be functional problems, but for the most part, they're an aesthetic issue um, and with those lower viscosities, lower injection pressures, you can really control that. Um, liquid silicone rubber is a, is a closed loop system. So you're pumping under pressure and, and filling everything with pressure, traditionally pulling vacuum at the end of last point of fill to be able to pull that out. Okay, um, it's not, there we go. Uh, design for manufacturability considerations, you know, I, considering this part of the advantages of silicone as well. Um, you can use varying thicknesses. You can gate thick to thin. You can gate thin to thick. You can really do whatever you'd like when it comes to silicone. Um, I would say that there are different solutions for every product design. Um, this one in particular is a consumer product that in the center there is, is about an inch thick. And then on those thinner walls, you're, um, I think it was two millimeters, so 80 thousandths thick and then tapering off, it actually tapers off into as thin as possible. So, and we just trim the flash off, but that product in particular, it molds well. Um, you know, we don't really have any air trap or anything because you can, again, you're using that viscosity, that low viscosity to your advantage. High clarity, uh, <clears throat> naturally, this is a baby bottle nipple that we've been molding for about six years now. This product here, uh, we just mold with a regular silicone, a translucent silicone. Uh, that we source from Momentum Performance Materials is our primary silicone supplier. And they've been great partners throughout and they, they get, have given us great quality. You can achieve the high clarity and higher clarity by adding polishes to the mold. So similarly to some of maybe rigid plastics, um, you know, you'd be familiar with if you, if you really polish that off, you get high clarity. Same thing with silicone. It's going to mimic the surface that it is a part of, that the mold is made of. Resealable valves, uh, silicone tends to do a lot better in resealable valves, duckbill valves, SEPTA products, so on and so forth, because of its nature to have that good memory, good elasticity, it can kind of find itself back to it, you know, back to itself and it and allows you to have one-way valves and so on. Um, so that's another great benefit of silicone. Um, undercuts, 
this this product you see over to the right is a Tita that we currently make. Um, it doesn't show the suction cups very well, but if you look on the outside of that face and the little nose there, those are all suction cups that are run through uh, really just the blind hole. Um, the diameter on those suction cups is about a quarter of an inch, and the neck at which they're passed through is, I believe, an eighth of an inch. So it might even be less. I'll have to confirm that, but it is a, even a lot less, and it's just produced through a blind hole, and we can pull those right out. So undercuts are huge in silicone. I think it's one of the greatest benefits that you can have, um, as well as the varying thicknesses. So kicking over to TPE. Really where we see TPE stand out is the chemical bonding to other plastics. Silicone won't naturally do that. So, you know, toothbrushes are a prime example of a TPE and a polypropylene or an ABS blend um, where that TPE is bonding. If you were to choose to do silicone, you'd, we can talk about some of the other complications in a minute, um, but that TPE is going to naturally bond to that substrate. The silicone will not. Recyclability. Silicone is a thermoset elastomer, whereas TPE is a thermoplastic elastomer, hence the name TPE. Thermoset means you cannot rework it. Once silicone has been produced into its final state, it will remain as silicone. You can chop it up into fine, tiny pieces and throw it in a football field, just similar to what you do with tires, um, but it cannot be recyclable and then reused. TPEs, if you have rejects or sprues or other waste or something that you'd like to recycle, you can obviously grind those up, remelt, and reuse. Inherently, they are less tacky and don't have a lot of lint attract to them. So if anybody has children and you've dropped the silicone pacifier on the floor, you know how filthy it gets, whether whether it's, again, a teether, baby bottle nipple pacifier, um, they'll get filthy. They will pick up anything. Even within a couple inches, if it happens to be charged in that way, it will attract hair from a couple inches away. So. Um, <clears throat> TPE is great in that regard. Uh, lower processing temps, again, when you start talking about overmolding, this is important. We'll kick into that a little bit later. Um, and then same equipment as rigid plastics. You don't need to have a 55 gallon drum pump, um, that hydraulic drum pump that feeds the silicone up and through. Uh, you don't need, you know, to re essentially reverse your process. And again, that's on one of the, the slides in a little bit here reversing your process to be able to do silicone. So here is that slide. Uh, processing differences, as most of you know, TPE comes in a lot of millions and billions of tiny little pellets, which are then melted and then solidified into a final product. Um, LSR is the opposite. LSR is a one-to-one -one mix, part A, part B, very similar to an epoxy, that you start cold. You wanna keep below room temperature so you're not, you're not causing the chemical reaction to have. So one side of the LSR has a catalyst, the other has the inhibitor. Once those two come together, the catalyst will drive the inhibitor off. At elevated temperatures, it becomes an exponential cure. So you can actually control the cure rate a little bit by whether you put a little bit more A, or a little bit more B, you can kind of control that just a little bit. It's, it's, it's not earth changing or world changing, if you will, um, but it does modify those parameters and those process conditions just a little bit. Um, anyway, they'll start at room temperature in most cases. And what we'll do is we'll pipe cooled water around a static mixer assembly that mixes the unit, the, the parts A and part B. And that water keeps that entire process cooled until we get it into the mold. So once it's into the mold, that's when we're adding the heat. So operators are often wearing gloves. Um, you know, mold, molds are a little bit more challenging to build because you have thermal expansion that you have to take into consideration and so on and so forth. Um, so, and over to the right, you see two products that we currently make, one of TPE, the other of silicone at the bottom. Um, all right, moving on, TPE, uh, design for manufacturability consi considerations. Looks like my slides got out of order there for a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, bonding. Uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit. This product up to the top left to see is a cattle tag um, that was made with a TPU and a glass filled nylon grade, which bonded to one another. We did incorporate a few mechanical interlocks just to be just to be safe. But this was an electronic overmold of a flexible antenna and RFID for cattle tracking. Um, really cool project that we worked on. Obviously, that wouldn't be a good fit for silicone. 
um, just because of trying to overmold some of the of the electronics. Abrasion resistance. Um, Abrasion resistance of TPE is much better than that of silicone. You know, it's it's actually one of the it does a little bit better in that in that area. Um, silicone once you silicone because it's a it's an elastomer chain. Um, you know, it, one of the uh, gentlemen that used to work here before he kind of always illustrated to me if you can envision plastic and the bonds on a chemistry level, it's more of a ladder structure. Well, in silicone, it's more of just a bowl of spaghetti. So one of the issues is once there's a small slice in silicone, um, you can sometimes just rip it right in half, depending upon durometer and so on. But if you notch it well enough, you'll be able to kind of rip it and it'll never be a clean rip. It'll be very chunky and everything following that same type of spaghetti type bonding structure. Um, a uniform thickness, um, you know, this is something that has to be taken into consideration when you're when you're talking about TPEs. Um, we've tried uh, doing different wall thicknesses to the point where one wall thickness was double the other on a TPE project. And when we tried to eject the part, it actually punched right in to the product. And then obviously, you know, you just have a you know unsolidified mess of TPE. Um, simple design fix, but the bottom line is that uniform thickness in, in something like a TPE project is, is critical. Common defects, uh, TPE, you know, you see that warp, it takes a set over time. Um, so this is a product, this was a child tracker that we were working on for some time. Um, and as the kid continued to wear this, uh, this product, it started to warp, it started to take a set. The silicone will not do that. Um, over time, it just, it won't do that. So you can see these defects when it comes into play. Um, the sink, we talked about, you know, keeping the wall thicknesses similar. If you don't, you'll start to see sink. It's hard to see in that picture, but there is a little bit of sink. Um, this is actually a different product. It just happened to be the same color. Um, this one was, this one was a product that incorporated, again, some of the best of TPE's properties. We're over molding electronics here. Uh, the red button was made of a higher durometer TPE that was insert over molded into this product. Um, and again, the electronics are all in that, that bottom wrist, if you will. Uh, back rind is something in silicone that if you do get too thick and, you know, from a processing standpoint, you're not familiar with um, silicone, you will start to see back rind. And back rind is something that, again, you know, from our team standpoint, we've, we've seen it enough. We run a lot of thick parts, some parts as thick as an inch and a half, and we know how to work around that. And so we would be able to prevent that back rind. Um, and really what that is, is the materials expanding at parting line. And because the shutoffs are so tight, it's actually slicing itself right back into it. And you can see it's a pretty nasty thing. And then flash. Um, silicone flash is at two ten thousandths of an inch. So, you know, again, we talked about elevated temperatures of tools a little bit. We don't ever want to be below 250 degrees Fahrenheit when trying to cure silicone because it'll take forever. You can go up to about 425 degrees Fahrenheit and you know get to a process. We were molding some of the Livestrong bracelets, uh, similar product, different different company, of course. But those products in particular, that wristband, you could run at 425 degrees Fahrenheit and you're curing and removing the parts within 20 seconds, and those parts are flying off. And they're smoking and everything, but um, you know your biggest concern, obviously, at that point is is for is melting the bags that you're putting the product into. Um, but the flash is the flash is hard to control. Um, the flash can be really hard to control if you don't have a the right mold maker or the right venting approach. Uh, you can get flash consistently, shot after shot after shot after shot. Um, it makes it pretty challenging to work with when you're trying to do ejectors or poppets to to blow out uh, slides. You can get flash to go up those slides. And again, that number is two ten thousandths of an inch. So when you take into consideration thermal expansion of the steel or the aluminum, whatever you happen to be running at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, you have to be able to have those shutoffs be near pristine to be able to prevent that flash. All right. I've talked enough. <laughs> Weston, I don't know. I see if you can get some answers on this one, but I'm curious how COVID has affected everybody's business, um, not only from the virtual aspect. You know, I know that a lot of companies are able, you know, they have in individuals working from home and 
doing is doing everything that they can. Um, but I know it's affected us in a couple different ways. One of which I think it's it's made us super efficient at these virtual meetings and and, and probably better. Um, but it also has, uh, you know, we've we've gone through a, a tremendous growth during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, you heard me say earlier we've added a few professionals. Um, you know, we've we've closed a few new customers again because of our focus really in consumer products. Um, we brought some business back from overseas. Um, right now, it being Chinese New Year has also helped our case in some of those instances, bringing more business back. So, um, again, just out of curiosity, um, what everybody's thoughts? How has COVID affected your business? Can I go give them a, a minute here? Um, yeah, absolutely. But with everybody muted here, if we unmute them to allow them to answer oh, no, yeah. verbally, you get a lot of feedback. So um, yeah. let's see what we kind of get sent in across the waves here. Annette, I see that you have posted. Thank you. Staffing, I you know, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, staffing is one of those things from an operator level, you know, a lot of LSR products. Again, I, I talked about some of the com complexities of doing ejection. Um, it certainly has been a challenge um, to get skilled operators here and to maintain them. You know, you've, you've got the unemployment check that people can take advantage of. Um, and so it, it, it's been a challenge. Um, you know, I would say that we've gone through a higher turnover than we've probably ever seen. Um, but I think all businesses are feeling the same, you know, so I, I can tell you, you're not alone. <laughs> um, we've seen supply chains get extended by weeks, sometimes double. And, you know, when you start the discussion with those suppliers, a lot of it's labor related. Um, it certainly has been a challenge. Um, but again, you're not alone. It's been, I think, a challenge for everybody. Um, you know, I think sales reps in particular have struggled because they can't travel. Um, you know, all the travel restrictions, you know, you can't really quarantine and go elsewhere. But again, I think we've all done probably pretty well at getting good at these things virtually. A lot of, a lot of calls and, you know, everything else that have really kind of changed the scope of how things are done. Um, but overall, very, very different environment and uh, doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. So. Jonathan, I see that you posted as well. Thank you. And yeah, interesting and challenging. <laughs> so. All right, I'm gonna jump into the next one and you know start talking. Um, kind of what I did on this one, uh, you know, on the, on the last couple slides here is LSR versus TPE in these different categories, if you will, different industries, because I really wanted to tie in and just at least give you some of the thoughts of you know kind of again with our experience kind of where we come from when we're approaching this so electronics sensitive components you know we've over molded successfully a lot of different batteries and crystal oscillators and the list goes on uh, when it comes down to the electronic components and you know i can tell you that they're sensitive um good news about both lsr and tbe is that they can get fairly fairly low in injection pressures but the temperatures are wildly different right so you know, that's something you're going to have to keep in mind. Sometimes we've had customers come to us and say that uh, their product couldn't see a temperature above 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, guess what? That mixes LSR right off the plate. Um, brings us back into the plastic realms because it is a cool mold. 100% um, encapsulation. Um, you know, again, this is another one of those ones where if you're doing 100% encapsulation, what are you encapsulating? We've done magnets uh, as well, and you know magnets lose a lot of their magnetism um, under temperatures. You can actually remagnetize magnets, which I thought was pretty cool to learn a couple of years ago. But um, as you elevate the temperature the magnets come into contact with, it starts to lose its magnetism. So therefore, again, LSR probably not a great choice when you're trying to overmold magnets. Um, environmental effects. You know, is this electronic piece? Uh, this wristband that you see here, is it going to be left on a car dashboard in Arizona in the middle of the summer and that dashboard gets really, really hot? If that's the case and if that's a possibility, 
then you really would worry about that TPE product being deformed. If you're able to find a way to overmold that in silicone, again, I would say that when it comes to electronics, 75% of the way we're going TPE. Um, but when you start talking about the benefits of LSR, if this was a product, an electronic overmold that was overmolded in LSR, it can sit on the dashboard all day long. You worry about, you know, obviously some of the uh, transmittance of UV light and so on and so forth. But again, LSR being UV, UV stable is a nice feature to have. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, cleaning um, and, and, and general use. Uh, how is this thing going to be used? Those are all important factors. Um, LSR versus TPEs when we're talking infant female healthcare. Again, this is probably our biggest market. That pacifier that you see in the bottom left, we make about five and a half million per year. And then the breast pump flanges up to the top right, we make close to about 100,000 per year. So, and actually this year, it's expected to exceed that by double. Um, so as you can see, you've got good clarity, um, you know, on the silicone, that's a highly polished mold. That is a, uh, a 50 durometer silicone, it built robust. Uh, believe it or not, those are made in an aluminum tool. Uh, the ones in the bottom left, we do the pacifiers, that teal piece, and then the internal piece is a 50 durometer overmold. So that's actually an overmolded component. Um, we run those in high cavitation tools. They are run with cold decks, so they are wasteless processes and um, with some semi automation. The guards runs fully automatic uh, with just a robot, and then the overmold requires some hum human interaction. Um, but when you're when you're talking about LSR now versus TPE, give you a little bit of a case study on this on the um, on the uh, pacifier in particular, um, consumer interaction. Um, infants, you know, when, when our customer first wanted to approach this product, he was coming out with a TPE and wanted to know if TPE, there's probably some cost savings, um, but would TPE perform better? Well, what he found was that TPE actually did not perform better. It may have been a little bit cheaper, but it did not perform better because in the warmth of the baby's mouth, it would actually deform. And, you know, Reed uh, McCarty, do a little bit of research on him if you'd like. He is known as Mr. Pacifier. So he knows pacifiers probably better than anybody in the United States, maybe even the whole world. Um, but the pacifiers, you know, when we started with TPE, um, it was, they were starting to deform in the warmth of the baby's mouth. So that's when, when I'm talking about consumer interaction, it's important to know. Hypoallergenic, again, silicone would probably take the cake in that. Um, it's just inherently hypoallergenic. Nothing else needs to be added to it to get there. Um, and then durometer selection. You know, if we, I went all the way back to those other slides, you know, pacifiers, teethers, baby bottle nipples, they all like to fall somewhere between that 40, 50, and 60 durometer. Um, anything that goes much stiffer or much softer than that, it's probably not going to last forever. Um, we do make some children's utensils, kids' uh, plates, spoons, and cups. Uh, those are all of the higher durometer LSR, um, 70, 80, so on. Um, you know, and what it always comes back to is what is the customer use going to be as to why we always steer towards LSR versus TPE. Um, overmolding, LSR versus TPE. It's important to know the substrate properties. Uh, the pacifier that you, or the uh, mouth guard that you see up to the top right, that was a actually a four component molding process. That black piece was molded first. On the bottom, you can't see it. The black piece was an Eastman Triton material. And then underneath we have two different durometer silicones that would create little bite pads. Again, they're hard to see from this picture. And then the overmold was an EVA, um, oil and bite EVA so that it could conform to your mouth. Um, important to keep those substrate properties in mind, um, you know, especially when you're, it, submitting them to hotter temperatures. I and mean, when we did the silicone overmold, really had to take that into consideration. Bonding method, um, you can see we have some through holes. And on the bottom right, um, that was a pacifier that we were working on just in an R&D phase. You can see that between the silicone and that plastic substrate, there's no bonding at all. We had some mechanical interlocks, but obviously if you can see the very thin wall, hard to put any mechanical interlocks in that area. So therefore, with that, with that not being allowed or really possible, I should say, um, there was no bonding there. Shut off, extremely important. 
um, obviously an overmolding. And again, if you're trying to overmold a plastic substrate or electronics or anything like that, you want to know exactly where you're shutting off, especially when it comes to silicone, because you're transmitting heat through those shutoffs and through those registrations. So it's very important to know. And then part geometry, obviously, uh, you know, with the overmolding, sometimes overmolded parts don't end up the way that you expected. <laughs> um, you know, I can honestly say that from from just experience, uh, whether it's silicone or TPE, sometimes things change a little bit because you you learn a little bit more. Um, thankfully, we've learned, you know, lesson after lesson after lesson. And I think, you know, now we've got a really good idea uh, when it comes down to the part geometry. I mean, we our focus on overmolding between the baby banana brush that we produce and those pacifiers and then some of the other teethers, we overmold about seven and a half million products a year just in silicone. So um, part geometry is very, very important. LSR versus TPE versus metal versus TPE and medical. Um, you're gonna really focus on sterilization and regulatory requirements, I think, for this. Um, obviously, other considerations come into play. Um, you know, silicone, sometimes you may have to post cure the product. Silicone can outgas some light ends or volatiles uh, that need to be post cured. So that's after the molding process. The post curing is something that, you know, material supplier can help you kind of understand. Um, you know, when we go into the silicone, again, it's very easy to sterilize. Um, very, very simple. It can really undergo anything and um, has really been probably the, at least on our end in the things that we've molded, has been the material of choice when it comes to silicone. You know, you see the very small gaskets up to the left. This is a nasal bulb um, right in the middle uh, that has some, you can see high clarity, some undercuts. It's actually, it's got duckbill valve uh, uh, geometries in it as well. And then the bottom right is a 16 inch by 10 inch uh, gasket that gets sandwiched between two plastic trays and is used for a DNA plasma extraction. So um, LSR versus TPE, when we're talking industrial, uh, you know, we do, again, I would say the, the majority of our business is consumer infant and female healthcare. We do some industrial, some medical. Uh, we do have one aerospace product kicking around. Um, but, you know, when it comes to industrial, I think environmental effects um, is one of the more important ones um, because you have to understand. I mean, the, the piece at the bottom we actually make for a dentist, um, and it's, a, it's part of a larger assembly of a lot of different parts. Um, but that product in particular, again, I mentioned it earlier, it gets doused in bleach for 24 hours. It's literally just thrown in there. Um, we haven't tried it with TPE, but I don't know that TPE would ever last through 24 hours of bleach. I'm, I'm just not sure. The LSR, it, it did. It proved to actually work. Um, and so we actually overmold. This is a 16 inch long piece of plastic. We actually mold and overmold with silicone. Uh, the top left is a Cool product um, in the middle, you know, I talk about memory and compression set. <clears throat> Both of these products, it matters, but really in the top left, uh, that blue piece, it's a polycarbonate piece that we actually mold together around that silicone piece, which is blue. So we call that the bladder, the silicone piece in the middle, the blue piece. And as the pool water, this is a pool jet replacement, and as the pool water flows through, you can kind of control the speed of the pump, this will allow the water to agitate more or less dependent upon the speed of the pump. So it's a really cool product. It will retain its shape from day one. So if you're running your pool pump high speed five years, it should be absolutely fine. And I would fully expect that as soon as you turn that pump off after five years, that would go right back to the same, um, same shape. Um, when we're talking product development, uh, you know, this is one of the ones that I got input from one of our engineer, engineers earlier today, uh, they thought I should throw this in there is from a product development prototyping standpoint, what's the difference? Um, LSR prototyping, you really got two different methods. Um, you've got RTV casting. So they're 3D printed acrylic molds and it's made with a room temperature vulcanizing silicone. Um, you can buy those uh, from most silicone suppliers. I know a lot of individuals that come to us, whether they're entrepreneurs and or engineers with larger companies, they've traditionally dealt with smooth on 
but all the larger players like Momentum, Dow Corning, Vocker, they all sell their castable materials as well. And again, RTV standing for room temperature vulcanizing. Um, it gives you a silicone feel, um, you know, so when that parts in your hand, it's the same size and shape and it, you, you know, you can squeeze it and so on and so forth. And it gives you that feel, but it's not functional and safe to use. You know, this product here uh, is part of a sippy cup um, and that was just a casted version. And, you know, the customer asked us, can we, can we sample this? And I said, I wouldn't recommend it um, simply because this is a material that's made with these RTV um, materials, which are made of a lot of different things that are not safe to use and, and safe to interact with children. So um, we actually built a compression mold. Um, our customer had all the prototypes, so I couldn't get a picture of that before now, but um, compression molding, it, it's a proof of concept. It's aluminum traditionally, low cost. Um, you know, you're talking less than a couple thousand dollars to be able to get an aluminum compression mold, put some liquid silicone rubber in it with some pigment, and then, and then use it as a proof of concept. The product you see here, you see all that flash, um, this is something that from, this is one of the downsides to compression molding. Um, you know, you have to put in extra material to vacate all the air trap and everything else to get out of there. So you have to put in extra material and that traditionally will flash over. Um, this is common overseas compression molding. We use it as a way to help kind of springboard our customers products and their new opportunities. So. In some cases, we've had customers actually launch a compression mold with an injection mold, and that compression mold, you can actually send those parts because it's made of the same material in the same pigment. You can send that for testing, um, you know, to to third-party testing labs and, and get your consumer product safety testing done before the injection mold is completed. I will say that the lead time of a compression mold versus an injection mold in LSR is probably one, well, it's about a quarter. So we can get a compression mold in about three weeks. Uh, whereas an injection mold is gonna roughly run you around 12 weeks. So it's a very good thing, especially, you know, if you're working for larger companies and you're looking for real feel, real functional silicone products, compression molding might be the way to go. TPEs, um, you know, prototyping with plastic has been around a little bit longer than prototyping with silicones. You know, there is some 3D printing silicones now. Um, they're limited, limited in geometry, limited in durometer selection. So in most cases, uh, it's just better to go with the aluminum compression mold. You get that final product the exact same way you would get it out of an injection mold. Um, but going into TPE, you know, you've got the rapid prototyping, FDM, SLS, Polyjet. They're all available for TPEs. They're all, all available. And there's a variety of durometers and colors available. So again, this is something that you can put in your hand it will mimic its properties a little bit more than a casted silicone part would towards silicone. So the, the 3D printed or the rapid prototype TPE will be a little bit closer to its relative than, than the LSR would be. Um, and then aluminum injection molding as well. This product here was a toothbrush, the bottom right, you see a toothbrush here. Um, there's a polypropylene um, inside and it had uh, two different overmolds of TPE, different durometers. Um, this was a new spin and new concept on a toothbrush. And, um, you know, we did this in single cavity aluminum injection molds. And the idea was there, let's use this as the proof of concept. Once we get that all set and sorted out and figured out, we can scale up um, into steel production tools. Um, and so with that, um, that actually wraps up the uh, presentation that I've prepared for you all today. Um, I want to say thank you to Sodic for being such a great partner, putting this on. Um, you know, hopefully I didn't bore you guys with <laughs> a lot of talking. Tried to break it up a little bit with the interactions. And, um, you know, so if you have any questions or comments, looking out for someone to partner, uh, let us know. Take a screenshot of, of my contact information below. Uh, readily available by cell phone, email, all day, every day. Um, so I guess now we'll open it up to Q&A, right, Weston? Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. And and uh, thanks for joining us here and doing this wonderful presentation. We did get a number of good questions for you. So your, your job oh, isn't over yet, okay? <laughs> um, first one, we'll start with, with looking for TPE and LSR and the gamma uh, compatibility info. 
Do you know gamma where they could find that? Gamma compatibility. Um, you know, that, that's a good question. Most likely you're going to be reaching out to the suppliers for that information directly. Um, you know, they should have some testing. You know, I, as we know, some of the testing isn't done on these materials because the cost is so excessive, right? You know, some TBEs haven't been tested to meet X, Y, and Z standards, same way as silicon. So I would recommend you go right to the, your suppliers. Um, if you're not familiar with who you might be reaching out to for silicone suppliers, feel free to email me. I can send you who we at least work with and put you in touch with a couple sales reps. Wonderful. Um, on, on tooling side or on the part side, how much undercut can be achieved? Is there a percentage of wall thickness? That's a good question. Um, I would say it's more related to durometer. Um, you know, I, I'm, I can, everybody can see my screen, right? Yeah, you should be able so, to, yeah. This is, I mean, you know, when you're talking about Milton's a little, you know, you're seeing him in and out, but he is entirely hollow on the inside. So if that gives you any indication of how much of an undercut you can actually pull in silicone. Now this requires, a, you know, a, a hand loaded process, of course, but this is a 30 durometer silicone. We can peel this entirely out. Um, we've done undercuts in 70 durometer, um, in 60 durometer. Um, you know, you wanna stay away from some of the lower ones, if you're looking for undercuts for sealing properties, you're going to really want to focus in on your 30 shore A's. Um, and, you know, could it be a function of, of um, wall thickness? Yeah, but again, I, I think a lot of it comes down into, um, you know, durometer as well. So. Excellent. Uh, there, there was a term that you used earlier in the presentation, Mike, um, compression set. Our, our audience wasn't um, familiar with it, wondering what that means and is that low pressure to mold? Yeah, so compression set, good good question. Um, we actually work on a product now for a consumer. Uh, it's a consumer product. It is a, it's a, it's a manual French press for coffee. Um, and the product, is the, it was a plunger seal on the bottom and what happens is that the original product was made of santaprene and then another TPE. And what customers were doing when they were interacting with this product is that they would leave, even though the company said, don't leave the TPE gasket, don't leave that gasket, you know, in contact with the wall over time because it will take a set. That's what happens. It will actually, it will physically and permanently deform. Whereas from a silicone standpoint, you could leave that in there forever. And that, compre that compression set is effectively zero. But the way that they test that is they do they continue they do continual tests and they they'll um, accelerate those to kind of and show how much is that material under this amount of pressure changed from you know its original shape over time. So they'll they'll extrapolate that out and provide you with a compression set factor. Silicone will probably always outproduce TPE long term. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next question here, can you control flash well with a compression mold for LSR? Yeah, you can. Um, it's, uh, it, there are people will put in tear beads and tear strips. Um, you, know, you watch enough videos, you'll see someone from overseas on YouTube making a, you know, making a product and you'll see that from, I don't know, again, looking at the screen, maybe from this product here, this is the breast pump flange that you saw. They might have a ring around that you, you're able to just peel off. Um, it's not perfect. You know, I will tell you it's not perfect um, and it's durometer dependent. So lower durometers are really going to struggle with that, whereas high durometers will do a little bit better. Wonderful. So talking a little bit about molds, right? The tools. Um, what is a comparison for a TPE mold versus an LSR mold um, cost wise specifically? Good question. Um, the uh, LSR TPE, it depends. You know, we've had some LSR tools, geez, I want to say as little as $7,500, but we've also had LSR tools all the way up to $350,000. So, you know, those tools where you're you're in the higher echelon, if you will, um, those tools in particular incorporate cold deck, just, you know, similar to what you would do in, in TPE. You're running hot decks or hot tips or something along those lines. Again, the process is the opposite. So from a from a plastic standpoint, you're hot right until you're gating. Well, from silicone, you're cold right until you're gating. So it's a wasteless process. So 
to answer your question, you know, I think that um, our molders for us quote them the same um, at this point. Um, you know, it's uh, we've actually converted tools back and forth. You know, I showed you that little pacifier that didn't have the bonding in it. Um, that granted was a rigid plastic that went to an all silicone, but you know, we actually were able to turn. Wow. Well, that's the plastic and silicone, and now that's the all silicone. But we converted that tool from plastic to silicone for our customer uh, within a four week time frame to be able to get it to go to an all silicone version. So, um, good question. I think that, you know, in theory, they're a little bit cheaper, maybe only by about 15% if you're comparing apples to apples. Great. Um, right along that line now, can a regular mold maker? of thermal plastic tools build LSR tools? Very, another very good question. Um, there are certain things that you need to consider. Oftentimes, you know, our Rolodex for mold makers is pretty small, um, you know, and, and the reason for that is we've done a lot of education to our mold makers and we work with them on the design. So, um, you know, it's not, you know, if you're building a mold for us, you're not building a mold and saying, this is what it's gonna be, this is what it's gonna look like. We often have a lot of input into the design uh, with tapered shutoffs and so on and so forth, um, it does require a much different, really approach. It's again flashing at two ten thousands of an inch is, is pretty specific, and then again you have to have the experience to know more more slides, more automation, those types of things in LSR molds traditionally do not pan out well. Excellent. Um, with with the molds. You know, how do you guys heat your LSR tools? Do you use cartridge heaters, hot water, hot oil? Um, and additionally, what would the typical mold temps be for LSR? Cartridge heaters are probably the go-to in the industry. Um, you know, and some mold makers, mold makers that have silicone troubleshooting capabilities, uh, where they have silicone molds, mold, molding machines in-house, um, they'll use a little bit of a different setup, something that's custom to them. Um, you want to stay away. The, another beauty of silicone is it is a very clean process. All of our machines are all electric. You know, there's no hydraulic oil spilling on the floor. You don't have to worry about hot oil for heating the molds. It's a very good question, but it uh, traditionally is cartridge heaters. Okay. Uh, this question, they say, generally speaking, with uh, or will a 50A TPE and a 50A silicone well, they both recover and rebound from stretching the same. In the short term, yes. Um, at different temperatures, no. But in, in long term, silicone is always going to outpace it. So, you know, we have this this watch band product here um, that that we mold, um, and this is in silicone. And this happens to be a seventy, but you could stretch this millions of times; it will always go right back. If this was a TPE or a TPU, eventually you're going to wear it out to the point where it will plastically deform and not be recoverable. Excellent. Um, with consideration to cycle times, can you compare LSR to TPE? Yeah, I feel like there's a misconception out there that silicone is always, you know, so much of a longer cycle time. As I was kind of preparing for this, I was trying to see, um, you know, what what do, what do people believe out there? What do they read out there, and so on, and you know, you find some blogs written by, you know, companies that are selling us their TPE products and or silicone products. And there's this misconception that silicone is a lot more expensive, um, that it's a lot longer of a cycle time. Uh, but I'd argue that we actually run silicone processes a lot faster than we do TPE. Um, you know, maybe that's because in the TPE applications we get, we're over molding things. You know, we're doing a lot of complex type of situations. But as I said before, in silicone, I mean, we, we were running, if it's a thin, uniform product, you know, you could run that mold up to 450 degrees Fahrenheit or as low as 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And that cure time, that cycle time is wildly different. Wonderful. And with that, that um, is the last question we have at this point here. Um, I do want to take time, Mike, and Thank you very much for taking time out of your, your day and your week here to join us on Sodic and Friends. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And to all the um, attendees, thank you for joining as well. Um, we do have, I guess, quick rundown here. We have some upcoming webinars uh, in two weeks. We have KPM Analytics joining us on an IR camera for quality. Um, 
scheduled further out, we have the Madison Group. Uh, we, we do have CMD uh, on a tooling side. And we have a couple other uh, webinar, uh, silicone-based webinars with Graco, um, some material suppliers with Shinetsu and Dow uh, coming up. So um, come back, join us once again um, here in two weeks. So again, thank you, everyone. Um, Len, Bennett, I don't know if you guys either one have anything that you would like to add otherwise yeah no i think you you covered it um michael thank you so much it was it was a very very good web uh, webinar and we'd love to have you back again some sometime as well and um thanks thank so you. much thanks everybody for attending thank you thank you all thanks, thanks everyone guys. take care bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.